there may be some colleagues who've uh, come to one of our meetings for the first time. And what I would um, urge you to have a look at is this document, which we have copies of uh, at the front. This is a copy of the court decision made in July. And actually, this is, this is the, the, the source of some of the, the controversy. But actually, um, again, for colleagues who don't know, uh, the Save Southall Town Hall campaign was a campaign established late in 2017. I'm sure Paul will talk more about it. Uh, and we sought a judicial review of Ealing Council's decision to, to sell the building. The process went on, reached a full hearing. This is the decision. Please have a look. It's in fairly straightforward language uh, insofar as legal judgments can be straightforward and it actually contains on the front page details of the main parties to the case and our organization Southall Community Alliance is not one of them but people are providing all sorts of stories and misinformation and to use um, Donald Trump's famous phrase a lot of uh, fake news is circulating out there in the ether and what we're keen on is, is actually sharing the facts and so we're been really kind in sharing a lot of kind of personal and private information about today's meeting, why things have not happened as we expected and planned. Um, and so I think, please, have a look at this. Also, we've got various documents which are highlight our campaign, including this lovely colourful document, which I hope that colleagues can take away and, and, and enjoy. Uh, I'd like to pass over now to, to Paul Harold, so that Paul can provide a legal perspective. Um, first of all, thanks for everyone for coming out to the meeting. Just an introduction, my name is Paul Heron, I'm a solicitor at um, the Public Interest Law Unit, which is based in uh, Lambeth or takes cases from around London and the South East and those cases are primarily interested in tackling both local government and national government over unlawful decisions. Um, I'd like to start the meeting by thanking Jan Paul of the Southall Community Alliance and Suresh who's the chair of the SAVE Southall Town Hall campaign, but also, and in particular, I'd like to thank all the campaigners who were involved in the campaign to save Southall campaign, because as a lawyer, personally, and personally myself, and also we as an organisation, believe law is not just something that is above the people, it's part of and should be uh, part of a campaign and should be in the position of not being above a campaign but be very much part of the campaign. And we were very happy to assist what was a united community campaign spanning, as Suresh said, all denominations, all parts of the community, no matter where they were and where they're from. But in particular, I'd like to thank the client Mahim Dapal, who instructed us personally because he was a user of the services at uh, South Hall Town Hall. On the 20th of July 2018, at the World Court of Justice, His Honour Judge McKenna ruled in favour of my client and against the London Borough of Ealing. So what was this case about? On a local level, the case was a challenge to the disposal of Southall Town Hall, which is, as everyone here recognises, or hopefully will recognise, <coughs> is a community asset for all of the community, irrespective of who they are and where they're from. And as the court said, it was a building that is heavily used by Southall residents. This is actually in the judgment. A building that is heavily used by Southall residents from the black minority and refugee groups, 
often with low, low incomes and multiple disadvantage. Current tenants include HelpLink, a charity which provides guidance and support to vulnerable sections of ethnic minority communities. The Southall Community Alliance, an umbrella, an umbrella organisation of over 100 mainly small or new community groups in Southall, which provides capacity building and office space. And the Migrants Advisory and Advocacy Service, which is a charity providing legal help to disadvantaged communities in Southall and works primarily on immigration and other legal areas. Now flowing from that, the case also highlights the desperate rush of local councils up and down the country and sadly I'd have to say, from a personal perspective, sadly I'd have to say Labour councils who are looking to dispose of properties of community, of, of community assets sometimes under the noses of the community with minimal consultation in order to balance their books. In this case, we argued and we said from the outset that the council had failed in its duties in two crucial ways. The council, we said, had failed to regard, had failed to have regard to a material circumstances in deciding to sell the building. That is, the council, Ealing Council and Labour Council, failed to give proper consideration to the disposal of the building for less than best value. Under a circular issued by the government, uh, circular 064 slash 2003, which again is outlined in the decision which hopefully you'll all see, councils have the opportunity to consider less than best price when selling an asset. So if a community wants to club together and put in a bid, just because it's under the best bid, if it's from the community, local councils have the opportunity to properly consider that bid. And a bid went in from the Southall Community Alliance. Now admittedly, it was a rush bid, but that was a rush bid based on the fact that they hoped to convince the council that it was a bad idea. But nonetheless that bid went in and we argue, we argue that that bid was not properly considered by the council. We also said there was a breach of the public sector equality duty. That is, there was no consideration of the extent or nature of adverse impact on those with protected characteristics and no proper mitigation had been identified. This is the law and councils as public bodies have a duty not just to look at the law but to follow the law and consider the law and we argued, our clients argued and the campaign has supported that as far as we are concerned the London Borough of Ealing, the Council, the Executive, the Cabinet had failed to consider that. What did the court say? With regard to the circular and considering a bid of less than best consideration, the court stated the following. It is clear, in my judgment and from an analysis of the documents, that whether or not the Cabinet were aware of the exception, there is absolutely no evidence that at any time they considered its application. So basically we had a bid gone in from SCA, there was a bid from other parties, and the court has said, looking at all the available evidence that we provided, that we showed, that when we had our clients come forward and give witness statements, looking at all that evidence, there is nothing to show that the cabinet, that the London Borough of Ealing, had bothered, had considered, had looked at the bid that was provided by the SCA. And in failing to do so, how could they even begin to look at the, at the circular? And they hadn't. And they hadn't. And I tell you why they hadn't. Not only from our evidence, 
Not only from what we said, what we looked at the documents, what my client said, but it's the fact that Ealing Council failed themselves to provide any disclosure, anything in their defence, to show that we were wrong. They didn't do it, because they hoped that we would fall on our faces. With regard to the public sector equality duty, the court stated, and I think this is actually it's just as damning as anything else, but the court stated, when considering what Ealing Council had done, there is really no need for me to consider ground two, that is about the equalities duty. Had I done so, I would have had no hesitation in concluding that the process by which the equalities impact assessment was prepared was grossly deficient and that the defendants failed to have due regard to the public sector equality duty. That's the situation. That's the situation. That is the failure of the London Borough of Ealing. It had failed to consider my, the, my client's bid and it failed to consider the public sector equality duty. And in doing so, it acted unlawfully. And the court had no choice but to say, you've acted unlawfully. You go away and think again. And it's quite right that they do that. Because if the court does not put a stop to this kind of behaviour, what other community assets are going to be sold? What other community assets will be taken from the community, from all sectors of the community? We want to stop that kind of behaviour. Ealing Council has a duty to consult with all of the community and that's what my client was saying. So what are the lessons for us and what are the lessons for the council? If you're going to sell a property under the nose of the community, bear in, bear in mind the equality duty. Bear in mind that you can and must consider selling to the community for less than best value. But ultimately it also highlights what kind of council we want and what kind of councillors we need. We don't need councillors who are being councillors or accountants or carry out cuts. We need councillors who are prepared to fight for the community because that, in my view, is what they're elected to do. But we want councillors in Ealing to link up with councillors up and down the country to fight austerity. We've had, we've had the best part of a decade of austerity, of cuts to council services, not just in Ealing, but up and down the country, with libraries closing, care homes closing, youth clubs closing, and all the rest of it. Because we feel, my client feels, that the uniting the community is the most important thing. The use of the building, that building needs to be invested in as a community asset for all the community. Not just for, for us now, but for future generations to be able to, to use that. It is an asset for future generations. I'm proud to have represented my clients and happy we won the case. And I hope that you know, the council and the work that, the, that my colleagues are doing here and the campaigners have done bear fruit. I hope the council leader is, has the decency to sit down with us. I hope the, uh, the, the temple will sit down with us. And let's build a united campaign to defend the community asset, let's invest in that community asset, not just for ourselves, but for future generations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, that's really inspiring and actually very factually helpful for us all to know. Can I uh, just share one other detail with, with colleagues? Uh, well, two details. Firstly, our campaign, although it had a very strong legal element to it, is a community campaign. Although we're missing the politicians from today's table, actually it's talking about the community and what the community might lose. That's really why we invited it here. So that's really the nub of, of our meeting and our, our campaign. How can we preserve assets for all of us and not just for a section of Southall or its residents? The other thing to bear in mind is uh, this.
campaign and the legal action are relatively new. But actually our organisation was complaining about the potential sale of the town hall for over two, possibly almost three years before the sale took place. And that's crucial. We didn't know who the seller was, sorry, the buyer was. We didn't know who any potentially interested parties were. So we were campaigning on the basis of saving a building that we all love and have a special affection for and interest in. So I think that's really important to remember for more than two years before the sale decision in September 2017, there were people campaigning to stop the building being taken out of public hands. Uh, yeah, my name is Moni. I'm not actually a resident of um, South Hall. Um, I was working for South Black Sisters and through them got involved in the State South Hall Hall campaign. And I have to say what a privilege it was, uh, is to be part of this campaign. And particularly what a privilege it is to be here tonight because it's so inspiring, especially for someone of my generation where I think apathy is increasingly present, to see everyone so involved in their community and so passionate about the future. So I think that's a genuine amazing. Um, I actually did have a real question. <laughs> um, obviously, this issue is not just to look at posterity, but austerity is relevant to sale of public services. And so I was wondering, and I know there are a few lawyers in the room, what can councils actually do to resist central government policies on austerity? What powers do they have and what should they be doing? to instead of you know instead of falling down bowing down to central government um, in policies which actually are very harmful to the vulnerable and our communities. So that's for anyone. Thank you very much. It's nine nine twenty five and finally we have a question. Thank you very much Penny. Can, can I can I just ask my colleagues at the front to give us any any closing thoughts and, and to deal with that that issue. This is, um, I think this is probably a personal point of view rather than a, a legal point of view in terms of what local councils should do. In my personal point of view, um, local councils and councillors should, at the start of the financial year, set a needs budget. And that needs budget, otherwise known as a deficit budget, should say, central government grants is 90% of what we need. We need 100% of our grant. There's 10% missing, and we're going to campaign for that 10%. We're refusing to carry out cuts. Ealing Council should link with other councils up and down the country. Labour councils control increasingly large amounts of local authorities up and down the country. If those local councils stood together in the history of the Labour movement. The Labour movement was built on the Poplar Councils in the 1930s, the Clay Cross Councils in the 1970s, the Liverpool and Lambeth Council in the 1980s that refused to carry out cuts, refused to do the dirty work. And the difference between what happened to the Lambeth and Liverpool councillors and today is those councillors will not face their jobs. Yes, they'll face a battle. Yes, they may have to face the wrath of national government. But if all councils stood together, united, then it's hard to see how a national government backed with a mass movement in London and throughout the country would be able to do something about it. The reality is the Ealing Council has got 50 million pounds worth of reserves. This research has been done and as my colleague Rianne said at the back, Ealing Council is giving away things when in fact they should be campaigning, investing in things and refusing to carry out cuts and to carry out the Tories dirty work. That's why in my view we voted Labour councillors in. It's probably the view of many people here and what the likes of, and I say this from a personal point of view, it's not a legal point of view, but the, the Labour leaders who are currently in power, like Julian Bell, need to wake up and smell the coffee. The Labour Party has changed, it has got far more members, it's far more radical, and it's a different type of Labour Party. That is 
and, and people are waiting for a lead, they're waiting to get involved in campaign, and unfortunately, Julian Bellevue not prepared to carry out the campaign and stop uh, carrying out Tory cuts and stand aside and let other people do the job that you are clearly failing to do.